might make me famous. Anyways, uh, we're in this Christmas series called Christmas Connections, and <laughs> and uh, yeah. Anyways, we're in the series. It's it's awesome. Pastor Scott talked last week about dreams. Did you see how many dreams there were in the Christmas story? And I loved jo um, jo Joseph's obedience, where it was like every time he had a dream. He straight away obeyed the Lord in the dream. And you know what? Here's the deal. The, the connection there is God's going to show you stuff. It might not be at Christmas. It might not be about Jesus coming to earth for the first time. But God's going to show you stuff. And our job as believers as we follow Jesus is to receive that dream or that word from the Lord and then be obedient. Carry it out. So anyways, Joseph did that. So thank you, Pastor Scott, for that. Last week, this week, we're going to talk about angels. Angels. So, um, yeah, lots of misconceptions. We kind of covered this a little bit when we talked about heaven, because we had to talk about angels in that Philly cheese cream commercial, right, where the angels in heaven spreading uh, Philly cream, cream cheese on everybody's bagels, right? And you're like, that, that's not biblical, okay? That's not in the Bible. It's like, well, I thought I read that in the message somewhere. It was like urban garlic, cream cheese, and it was a sesame toasted bagel. It's not in the Bible. Anyways, I really need to dial this down from 100 to... I don't know what's, what's happening with me. Anyways. <laughs> Too much good. Well, and I'm not even finished. It's around here somewhere. Um, angels in the Christmas story. Angels in the Christmas story. Uh, you know what I wish is there's lots of uh, mentions of angels in the Christmas story. And I wish Luke or Matthew, or any one of these guys would have literally like said, like put a little footnote and said, this is what he looked like, or this is what the angel looked like. This is, you know, why they were terrified. All of that is a little bit mysterious. There are some descriptions in the Bible, which we're gonna go through a little bit here in a second. But, you know, and we'll talk about this as well, so I'm kind of bearing the lead here a little bit. The, Angels are all through in Scripture, and the most concentrated place in Scripture where angels show up is around the birth of Jesus. It's around the birth of Jesus. Anyways, let, well, why don't we read it? Let's read the story, and then you guys will have a little bit of a little bit of context. Luke two eight, and this is so familiar for everybody. Luke two eight, it says, and, and there were shepherds living in the fields nearby, and they were keeping watch over their flocks by night. And say it with me, an angel. Of the Lord appeared to them. So that's a different day at work. <laughs> right? Imagine you were at work and all of a sudden, whoa, angel. What you picture it, however you picture it, and you're at work. Angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. Take that in. But the say it with me, the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. You'll see this as a theme. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You're going to find the baby wrapped in cloths and lying in, of all places, a manger. And suddenly, like, can you imagine? If you, yeah, right? If you had your iPhone, you'd be inst instantly famous. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host, not just one angel, a multitude of angels, a heavenly host, another old timey word there, appeared with, say it with me, the angel, praising God and saying, dial back on that in a second, <coughs> glory to God in the highest heaven. And on earth, Peace to those on whom his favor rests. Boom. When the angels, plural, had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that's happened, which the Lord has told us about. And we went through that on week one a little bit, just fleshing that out. And if you want to do a great meditation, just meditate on that verse for a little bit. So they hurried off, found Mary and Joseph, and the baby was lying in the manger. So that's a prophet. That was a prophecy that happened within hours, right? You're going to find a baby in a manger. It's going to be the Savior. They found the baby. This is the Savior of the world. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what they had been told about this child. And all who heard it were amazed 
at what the shepherd said to them. These guys, these blue collar dudes, these just regular guys, had this tall tale about angels and babies and mangers and saviors of the world. And Mary treasured up all these things, pondered them in her heart, because she had an angelic experience as well, didn't she? Shepherds returned, glorifying God and praising God for all the things that they had seen, heard and seen, uh, which is just as they had been told. And that's what we just did. So we're kind of echoing them. But then on the eighth day, when it came time to circumcise the child, the child he was named Jesus, or Joshua, which means Savior in Hebrew. The name that the angel had given him before he was conceived. What are we going to call him? Well, the angel told me. Do you see the angel in all of that? So I don't know if your uh, you know curiosity has been piqued or tweaked, but um, I, I want us to get a picture of angels today, and the reason is is because our concept of the Christmas story can be so juvenile and so immature and so just about all the mystery and the magicalness of the you know that sentimentality that is pushed into everything in Hollywood and all that stuff, we have to remember this was God's plan for salvation. And this, as much as, you know, embrace, watch your Hallmark movies if you want. I can't say that, but you watch them. But don't miss the fact that this was God's plan for salvation, so much so that he sent multiple angels at multiple times to shout the news, glory to God in the highest, and peace on earth, which is what you receive if you know Jesus at Christmas, to those upon whom his favor rests. The, the power of this story is absolutely unmatched. It's unparalleled. And we can be caught off into this whimsical, oh, you know, you go to the dollar store, and it's like, you see snowflakes, and oh, there's snowmen. And it's just, you're just kind of like skipping through Christmas, Great. And we miss the fact that this was God's plan to save the entire world. Because there's some pictures of angels. I have a few of them on the board here for us. Like Raphael paints this picture. Is this what you think of when you think of angels? Could be, right? Okay. Like little fat babies with wings coming out of there. That, and you know those... Those wings are not going to carry those babies. I'm telling you what. I don't care how strong those wings are. It ain't, they're not getting off the ground. Just, I'm just saying, right? He probably didn't do his research on the anatomy. It's just like, you know. I can't do it. And everybody's like, you know, come on. You do it. Another, another picture, right? Like these kind of like, oh, they're covering their face. They're mysterious. They're in the blue skies. That space? Where is this? Oh, and those angels, those wings look serious. And, you know, this you know, kind of looks a little bit like a toilet paper commercial. <laughs> right? Like, it's just like, okay, what, what is it and why are these angels? And I guess, yeah, angels are cool, I guess. But let me, I don't want her to think about them. Right? Next. Right? Like, again, I, like, I don't know. Are you guys star people on your tree or angel people? Can we take a poll? Star people? Okay, because that's cool. That's biblical. Star Bethlehem. Angel people on the tree. Okay, we have what we had for years. A homemade angel was the. It was a. I think a school project. Not great. Not great. But it went up. <laughs> I can say that because my kids aren't here. But just not super great. But hey, there it is. There. Hey, let's put the angel. Yeah. So and again, like I don't know what your vibe is and whether you're into porcelain and stuff. But like this is apparently the Christmas angel. So of course the Christmas angel would have wore red. Yeah. And had a little crown, because that's what angels do, right? Like, are you, are you tracking with me? Like, we could totally just miss the whole thing. Because, like, the Bible does, isn't into all this. Like, it's not tracking with this stuff. But, oh, and by the way, Jessica and I were, we were looking online earlier, and I'm, this is fictitious. We weren't looking, but anyways, I have to set it up. We actually found, they have, they have video evidence or pictorial evidence of the actual moment when the angel appeared to the shepherds. And so we found that online, and here it is. This is the exact moment the angel appeared to the Right? <laughs> like it's like clip art Christmas, right? And where are we going to take our cues from? From clip art Christmas or from scripture? 
And of course, we're making so light of this, and I hope, like, I want it to be light, I want it to be funny, because it is almost laughable. That we can get so distracted by what the world wants us to think about. Oh, angels, they're just these cute little babies with little wings, and Raphael, oh, and he painted in the, you know, middle, um, you know, in the Reformation. So, of course, he knows what an angel looks like. And you're like, okay. Well, what does the Bible say? You know what, it turns out the Bible says a lot about angels. So let's just walk our way through that. Angels in the Bible. Do you know in Genesis, it doesn't get too long before God kicks Adam and Eve out of the garden because of original sin. And what is the next step he does? He takes a cherubim and puts the cherubim in front of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil to guard the tree of good and evil. Three chapters in, four chapters in, you're already experiencing angels. We know Jacob uh, experienced, he wrestled with an angel. He, an angel gave him a dream of all these angels ascending and descending into and out of heaven. And there was a whole promise given over him that you can read. In Exodus, do you remember, and if anything doesn't get your attention about the power and the realization that angels are in the Christmas story, it was the story of Exodus. And the the people of Israel were stuck in Exodus for 400 years. And God sent Moses to deliver the people. And Pharaoh said, no, I will not let the people go. I will not let these people uh, go to their promised land. They're our slaves and we're going to keep them. And remember, there was 10 plagues. And all of these horrendous things started happening in Egypt, which got Pharaoh's attention. You know the last one that got Pharaoh's attention? Was when the angel of death passed over the entire region, and all of the firstborn children died that didn't have the blood of a lamb over the doorposts and lintels. Does that get your attention, and does that represent what God is dealing with here when it comes to angels? No wonder every time an angel shows up, it says right after, there's an angel, they were terrified I don't say this to scare you. I say this to go, hey guys, maybe we should dig into this and look into this because God left all these breadcrumbs for us to understand who he was and what his plan is. And it's, it's not that. We know angels ministered to Elijah. We know angels shut the mouths of lions in the lion's den for Daniel. We know angels attended to Jesus in the wilderness. We know angels opened the tomb of Jesus. Angels at the beginning of all time, at the beginning of his story, at the end of his story. If you read Revelation, it's chock full of angels and other stuff. Angels are mentioned 273 times in 34 books of the 66 books in the Bible. God is using angels. How many angels are there, you might ask? We saw this multitude in the scripture we just we just read in Hebrews 12, 22. It's not on the screen. I'll just read it for you. You have come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, not Jerusalem on earth, in heaven. And countless of angels, countless, sorry, countless thousands of angels in a joyful gathering. Some versions say innumerable, and some say thousands upon thousands, and some say 10,000 upon 10,000. You know what that equates to? And I'm not good at math. 100 million. It's a lot of zeros. It's a lot of angels. This is not onesies and twosies and little guys holding candy canes with wreaths on their head. This is God's army. This is a God's army that will do his bidding. And this is God's army who is involved and invested in uh, interacting with people at these specific and special times. There are three angels that are identified by name in the Bible. If you go outside the Bible, there's a whole bunch of other stuff. Of course, we're, it's a little dubious on that, but Gabriel, we know about Gabriel, and we're going to come across Gabriel in a second. We know Michael, who's an archangel, both those are archangels. And then who's the other angel that we know by name? Lucifer. So we know about fallen angels. And we get this idea that two-thirds, or one-third of the angelic host left with Lucifer. Those are the ones that were obviously connected to Lucifer. Uh, you might question, well, you know, people will talk about guardian angels, and everybody talks about guardian angels, and it's got this 
real kind of fanciful piece on it, right? Like it's like, oh, my guardian angel is watching out for me. And as much as that also sounds really airy fairy and all that stuff, and you're, you want to dismiss it, Matthew 18.10 says, Beware that you don't look down on any of these little ones, for I tell you that in heaven, there, possessive, T-H-E-I-R, there, angels are always in the presence of my heavenly Father. Proof, biblical proof, depending on how you want to splice that. But yeah, there are angels that are assigned to you. At least Jesus is saying there was angels assigned to these kids. And if there's a hundred million of them, and there's, you know. Scripture is clear that angels guard and protect human beings several places in Scripture. Um, we know about cherubim. Cherubim are like warrior angels. And then there are seraphim, which are worshiping angels, specific and different types of angels. So we've got archangels and warrior angels, worshiping angels. But we see them essentially as God's messenger. We went through the whole series, the book of Daniel, and I would encourage you to read, uh, just watch that on our YouTube channel. There's so much in there, but multiple chapters. Daniel is just in prayer, and he's encountered by an angel, which gives him some kind of prophetic word. Idea being that the angels have some kind of intelligence where they can work with and understand and know the future and be a part of all of God's plan. Very significant. There's watcher angels, military angels, celestial armies made up of these people, or these beings. They're called the sons of God. So, uh, what do we know about angels? So just a little point form, bullet, bullet points here. They're created physical beings by God. High intelligence, superior moral judgment they just, they get it at a different level. They are ministering spirits. Hebrews says they're ministering spirits. And they're here to minister to God. They're also here to minister to us. Let that sink in. Multiple types, we talked about that. They can only be in one place at one time. They're not omnipresent. There's a rank among the angels. So this is what has shifted my mind, is instead of thinking a whole bunch of people in choir robes, I think about an army when I think about angels. And so when you picture an army going and executing all of the mission that God has in his salvation plan, it just changes the whole thing. This was a military operation. This wasn't some sentimental, fanciful thing that God was just like, you know what would be a great idea? I send a baby to earth. Oh, and there's going to be angels involved, too. Not that. They're powerful. You know, do angels have wings? Not all of them. Not all of them have wings. They're always depicted with wings, and that's because some of them are described with wings, but not all of them have wings. And we sang it this morning, and a little bit tongue-in-cheek, we sang angels we've heard on high, sweetly singing over the plain. We just read it, that the angels didn't sing, they said. Right? You with me? Uh, and do we have guardian angels? You know what? Most likely. I don't think you should pray to the guardian angel. The Bible never talks about that. We've got to pray to Jesus. Our focus is on Jesus. He's the Lord. He's the Savior. He's where all of our direction uh, comes to. You can ask him for angelic help. We used to pray that for our kids. You know, our kids would be afraid. And I would pray, dear Jesus, put a guardian angel at the four corners of this child's bed. And I believe it's my toes. I believe that Jesus hears those kinds of prayers. And so we have all of this information and it lands us in this place of the largest concentration of angelic involvement in the entire Bible. This, to me, shows so much importance to the Christmas story. And that it's not just some kind of fanciful thing that we're going to just eat some food, open some gifts, and just kind of walk through. No, even from God's perspective, this was, this was more important than the rest. So let's read, let's read some of the scriptures and then we'll pull out some thoughts out of this in a second. So Matthew 1, 20, 
It says, but after he had considered this, this is Joseph, this is, was Pastor Scott read this last week. After he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid, there it is, to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit, and she will give birth to, the, to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. And all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. So that Emmanuel is more of a title, but Jesus is the name. And here's what Pastor Scott talked about last week. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him. This wasn't his own thinking. This wasn't his own idea, and it's actually confirmed by Mary a little later on, because the angel says the same thing to her. And Mary took, and he, and he took Mary home as his wife, but he did not consummate the marriage until she gave birth to a son and gave him the name Jesus. They wouldn't have known to call him Jesus. The fact that we call him Jesus is directly uh, a result of angelic <coughs> involvement. Matthew 2, 13, when they had gone, so this is the wise men, when they had gone, the angel, or an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, get up, he said, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt and stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for this child to kill him. So again, I don't think Joseph was smart enough to understand the political climate. And when you start kind of throwing around titles like King of the Jews and a new king has been born, it's like, well, there's going to be some problems. You're going to face some adversity. And Joseph was the carpenter. He probably didn't see this coming at all. The angel reveals this to him. Matthew 2, 19. So he leaves, goes to Egypt. And this is after that. After Herod died, it was only a couple of years later. An angel of the Lord appeared in a dream. Again. Like if I was Luke, I would be including uh, again. <laughs> Luke doesn't put that. To Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up and take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel for those who are trying to take this child, this child's life are dead. So, you know, the, the one thing that I note about this, and this is just a Rob Sharp, this is not Pastor Rob, this is just me. Kind of, I read it the first time, you notice that he's, he's afraid to take Mary home, like there's this kind of idea of fear. And notice that all of these came in a dream, which is kind of crazy, because none of the other ones come in a dream, but the angel shows up in a dream. I feel like there was... Remember Daniel? Like, Daniel got freaked out. Every time an angel showed up, he kind of got freaked out. And then he didn't eat, and sometimes he was like, his stomach was upset for a week, and he was just in a mess. Because this angel just kind of, and I kind of like, you think you would get used to it. Every time I pray, oh man, I pray, and you're like, no, oh, come on, I just want to pray. I just want to, you know. And Joseph, it seems like, it, like Joseph's like, oh yeah, I, oh, yeah, I dreamed again, and the angel was there. And you can just picture Mary, again, seriously, with the angel thing. Like, you're... <laughs> I want to kind of lean into that and say, you know what? The more that you start to become aware of what's happening in the spiritual realm, the, the more you kind of dial into that and are responsible with that, the more God will reveal to you. Right? Luke 1, 8, it says, once when Zechariah, and you're like, Zechariah, he's not in the nativity set. Who is this guy? <laughs> well, before all the Christmas story, an angel shows up and kicks the whole thing off with this guy. If you don't know the story, this is where it actually all begins from this part of the story. Anyway, once when Zechariah's division, he was a priest. So once when Zechariah's division, division was on duty... He was serving as a priest before God. He was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood to go to the temple of the Lord to burn incense. So it was kind of his day to do church, if you know what I'm saying. And they would do church every day, in fact, multiple times a day. And when the time came for the burning of the incense came, and the assembled worshipers were praying outside, then an angel of the Lord appeared to him. So, you know, it's weird when the shepherds are out just at work and the angel appears to them. This guy is at church. He's doing his priestly duties, and all of a sudden an angel shows up. Standing at the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah uh, saw him, he was startled and he was gripped with fear. It's like, you know, we always say, oh, come, Lord Jesus, come. And this one day, they've been praying, oh, come, Holy Spirit. And it's like, boom, boom, here you go. It's like, ah, what do we do with God when he shows up? I don't know. He, does, he didn't know. But the angel said to him, 
Do not be afraid. Okay, there it is. So the, like these beings, they're not to be trifled with. It's not this little three-foot little Cupid doll where you can pat on the head and go, oh, you're so cute. It's, he was terrified. He was startled and terrified. Not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your, your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. And he will bring, he will be a joy and delight to you, and many will receive, will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many people of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah, who was one of the most powerful prophets of all time to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready, and here it is, a people prepared for the Lord, the Messiah. He was going to prepare the way. That was John Baptist's job. And so, literally, Gabriel shows up to this guy. So Zechariah asked the angel, how can, you, how can I be sure of this? Which, again, are you going to question this being that just scared the life out of you? I'm an old man and my wife is well along in years. And the angel said to him, I am Gabriel. God sent his best to make this proclamation. I stand in the presence of God and have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent, not able to speak until the day this happens because you did not believe my words which will come true at their appointed time. And so we fast forward. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth in a town in Galilee. So we started this off, and six months later, this event happens, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And the angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, do not be afraid. Mary, you found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son. You were to call him Jesus. Can you imagine Mary and Joseph? Like they're, you know, um, she's showing like she's ready to have the baby and they're talking baby names. And they got that little book that you used to get or they're going online. Popular Hebrew baby names. Oh, what, Joseph, what do you want to call the baby? And it's like, in the back of her mind, she's like, the angel told me, Jesus. And in the back of his mind, he, Jesus. And he's like, well, I don't know. I'm, I'm going to suggest maybe Jesus? What do you think? I always like the name Jesus. Right? Like, can you imagine that conversation? It's just crazy. So, but the angel tells them both the exact same thing. God's plan. You're calling him Jesus. He will be great. He will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How can this be? So it's funny because Zechariah had a question. He was mute for the rest of the pregnancy. Quiet, you. And then Mary asked this question, and the angel's like, okay, we're going to talk about this. Mary asked the angel, since I'm, how can this be since I'm a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be, uh, though, so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. And then he even lets her in on the secret that Elizabeth has. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be unable to conceive in her, is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail, fail. And then all of a sudden Mary takes this all in. I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. And then the angel left her. You know, angels in the Christmas story. God had a plan and he was like, this plan has to work. This plan has to happen. I'm going to send my, my, my best. I'm going to send the highest level angels for this to happen, and their fingerprints are going to be all over this thing, you know. And uh, so you can sit here and go, "Okay, great, yeah, you, you've you've convinced me, Pastor." And now, when I think about angels, I'll try to kind of adjust my thinking. 
right? I'll try to kind of not think about these cherubs that were painted in the, you know, the Reformation era. You know, these little tiny wings or whatever. I'll try and adjust my thinking. And I, I think that you're missing the point. I think that's just the observation. What does God want to say to us as a result of that this Christmas? What does God want to say to you this Christmas? And so I came up with three things, and maybe the Holy Spirit is saying something different to you in this moment. Um, as sentimental and as beautiful and as warm and awesome as the Christmas season is, these angels to me tell me that this was a mission of God to send his son. That the world was in trouble. And the only way out wasn't some just fanciful story. It was an actual military operation which involved angels at the highest level to be involved to make sure that it was carried out. Explicitly with names and, and prophecies fulfilled and all of those things which the angels knew about. When you see an angel or think of an angel, just think they are part of carrying out God's plan for salvation on the earth. It's God exerting his mystery and his power all at the same time. And, and I love that. Because, you know, some people say, well, what about all the questions you have about God? And um, how can you explain this? And how can you explain this? And, and all that stuff. And I'm like, I'm okay with the tension. In fact, if there wasn't tension and I could figure it all out and I had all the answers, then he wouldn't be God, would he? If I could figure it all out, I want there to be mystery. I want there to be this kind of other world that's unseen, that has a hundred million angels or more. I want God to have that. I want God to have things that I don't know about. It's kind of like when you're two-year-old, you say, well, I got to go to work. And the two-year-old's going, well, what's work? And you go, well, that's what pays the bills, keeps the lights on, puts food in your belly, you know, all that stuff. The two-year-old doesn't get it. But I'm thankful that the father or the mother goes out to work to provide that stuff, and that's God for me. And so God is carrying out his plan for salvation because he knows we need him, even though some people don't even recognize they need salvation. Thank you, God. It's God's plan for salvation. It's a military operation. And then the second thing, and you've already picked this up, is this idea that there's so much more going on than meets the eye. I love that story when uh, Elisha, right? It, the, they, they are uh, encamped around by the enemy and they kind of circle the wagons and they're kind of like, you know, they're, they're under siege by this army. And uh, you guys have heard the story and probably heard it in your, in your Sunday school uh, stories, but the, the, um, the, the assistant is with Elijah. And, and says, uh, what are we going to do? Like, oh my gosh, we're, we're in trouble. They're all around us. And Elijah's there and just like, oh my gosh, this guy doesn't get it yet. He doesn't understand God. And so he says to the Lord, Lord, would you please open his eyes? And when he prays that prayer, all of a sudden the guy looks around, he sees their little camp. Then he sees the camp around them. And all of a sudden, just like this big curtain is rolled back. And all of a sudden he sees the Lord of Heaven's army angels in the skies above. And he goes, I think we're going to be okay. I think we're going to be okay. And Christmas, I love it because the concentration of angelic involvement and the supernatural intersecting doesn't happen all the time. I mean, if you've seen it or encountered an angel, well, then, then you're in, you know, the minority. Because it's not one of those things that, you know, A, we should go looking for, but B, you probably be even seen. But faith is believing without seeing. And I just pray that God would open our eyes. That sometimes when the spouse comes home from work or when the friend uh, does something or the co-worker does something, it's not them. We wish wrestle. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against rulers and authorities and principalities in heavenly places. And in those moments, we have to kind of go, hang on a second, something bigger is going on here, and we need to push into that. Because our God is bigger, and sometimes we're not resourcing ourselves because we're not 
We're not clued into it. So it's God's plan for salvation. There's more going on that meets the eye. And then the, the third thing in this, I love this as a general statement. I love this specific to Christmas. I love this just specific to the Christian life. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. You know, we live in a world that's product is not even the media you're consuming. It's fear. It's fear. And I had to confess to Carolyn this week. I, I bit the apple. I started, I'm like on my phone. Oh my gosh. And God's like, why are you afraid? Do you trust in me? Do you trust in my power? Do you trust in my strength? Do you trust in my plan for salvation? And it's astonishing to me that every time one of these military, majestic, powerful, highly intelligent, articulate beings showed up, the first thing they always say is, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. And I think that's in this situation, but that's general. Like, hey, why would you be afraid? You know, I've heard it said that there's 365 do not be afraid or fear nots in the Bible. 365, one for every day of the year. And we should take that to count. You, you, you got to do that search for yourself because I'm not good at math. <laughs> God's always at work. He's always in control. Um, Laura's going to come to the uh, keyboard. She's going to play. We're going to pray in just a second. Can I show you one more scripture that just, I, I was just kind of meditating on this. I'm just kind of like, God, open my eyes. Like there's a certain level that I understand and I know that's there and I'm seeing it in the Christmas story. Help me explain that well. Help us to kind of dr drill down deeper and make these Christmas connections this Christmas. But it came to my mind, um, this, uh, this verse in 1 Peter 1.12. And so this is talking about the prophets the idea that the prophets knew what the plan of salvation was and they prophesied about it and they talked about it and all this stuff. And so uh, 1 Peter yeah, 1, 12, it says it was revealed to them, the prophets, that they were not uh, serving themselves but you, which are the Christians that are now taking advantage of these prophecies being fulfilled in Jesus. And they spoke of the things that have now been told to you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. So all of this whole salvation thing has happened. And then he just puts this little, little piece in after. And he says, even angels long to look into these things. It's like, you know, when the world was fallen and when the, the fallen angels left and Satan took over, there was this kind of like obsession with earth. And so angels came down and helped us make a mess of the world, right? And I, I, I just kind of see God in his workshop and he knew the plan of salvation ahead. So you got to just kind of check the metaphor at the door here a little bit. But God in his workshop kind of hammering out the details for salvation and all the angels looking at the mess of the world and then looking at God building the plan for salvation. And they're all just like, hey, what's he up to? Oh, look at that prophecy. Oh, look what he's gonna do here. Oh, look at what's going Oh my, do you see that? And all of the angels are peering into heaven, looking at the plan of salvation before it's even happened. How's he gonna fix all this? Do you see what he's doing? He's gonna send himself. And all the angels are like, just giddy. But Peter throws this little thing in there. Angels long to look into these things. And it says, the, the Greek word kind of has this idea of like the craning of the neck to strain to see. So I can't, I can't even imagine, right? Gabriel, they're all just kind of straining. Oh, what's he doing? And then, oh, just tell, tell everybody. Oh, we can't all see. Oh, Jacob. Oh, oh, this is going to happen, the prophecy. Oh, this, oh, he's going to rise. Oh, hey, apparently you're going to go shut the mouths of lions. That's going to be cool. Hey, you're on for rolling away the stone. Okay, I better go work out because that's going to be it. I don't know. <laughs> Gabriel, you're going to tell Joseph the name of the Savior. Gabriel, you're also going to tell Mary the name of the one who's going to save the people from their sins. And Gabriel's like, okay. God's like, can you, can you do that? Yeah, I can, I can do it, God. I'm, I'm your man. Woman. 
neutral gender. And then Gabriel just sitting on the bench of heaven, just like for all time, as time passes and humanity keeps on making a mess of things, and Gabriel sitting there, he's probably doing other stuff too, but he's like, now God? Now? Is the salvation plan going to happen now? No, nope, not yet. Now? Is it going to happen now? No, nope, not yet. And then, in the, in the right moment, right? Because the Bible says, at the appointed time. Go. Gabriel says, I've been sent by God. To present you the plan of salvation. And we call it Christmas, but it's the plan of salvation for all of humanity. How great is our God? How great is our God? So this Christmas, when you want to just dig a little deeper into the Christmas story, and all of a sudden you start to think about these ones that are out there just helping God do his work, you can think about angels. How great is our God? Let's pray.